Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I should, should I do, I guess I should do the line now, right? This is, uh, you're, yeah, you're, 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 <laughs> you're listening to the, uh, Matthew Lupu podcast. Uh, I'm Matt Lupu. Um, so joining us today or joining me today, I should say is, uh, Austin Voykevich. So Austin. Got the last name, right? Not bad. <laughs> if there's one thing I think I've, uh, I've learned over the years, right? It's, uh, a, a, a difficult pronunciation is, uh, is one of them, right? I, it's one of my, one of my favorite things in life. Yeah. That's so, true. Yeah. So that is fair. So Austin, um, we got to be friends from, uh, we were both doing graduate work together at Florida State University. Um, Austin, you have your master's in Greek, if, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Uh, master's in history with a specialty in Greek, in Greek language, yeah. Wow. Okay. So so Austin is no joke. Austin is a, uh, as I always say, this is this is sort of like blood in, blood out, right? Like once you're well, once you're a classicist, you're a classicist forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so why don't you, you know, before we get into what you're doing now, um, why don't you give me a little bit of background and how you got interested in this subject in the first place? Was this something that you were always interested in from like the time that you were a little kid or was this something that happened when you got into undergraduate or, you know, how did you, how did you fall into the classics trap? Well, I think, I guess it would be somewhat of an untraditional route. Uh, you know, uh, I fell in love with classics, so to speak. And I didn't even know that classics was a thing when I fell in love with it through the movie 300 when I was roughly like 12 years old or so, or 13, whenever that came out. Yeah. Uh, went to the movie theaters, you know, or saw Leonidas kick someone into a hole and I was hooked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And from that point on, I just kind of developed a passive interest in history uh, it be, start, quickly became my favorite subject in school. It's first started out as like a broad interest in pretty much any history and any part of the world. I just took as many classes as I could in high school, uh, learned about as much as I possibly could. But in the back of my head, I always seemed to have favored the ancient world. And at least that always was like my my biggest interest. If I ever had to write a paper, I always incorporated some you know, classical text or, you know, a look at the ancient world in some way or including that perspective. And so that's kind of where it started. And it slowly, it slowly built um, throughout high school. And when I was about to head off to college, uh, I just kind of was looking at the list of majors and I uh, was thinking, oh, let's do stuff. Maybe I should do something technical so that I can like make a living and <laughs> kind of threw that to the wind and decided to just go for it and, and, and pursue a history degree as well as a uh, classical humanities degree. Wow. So, okay. So then you were lucky enough to be in an undergraduate that had some sort of classical type you know path because i i know that there's a lot of university programs out there that don't have that available so that you know that is to say that you know you're you're in a um you're in an environment where if you have an interest in ancient history there's a, a credible path forward so how did how exactly did it work you know where you went to school and and maybe you know we can talk a little bit about how it's how that's not necessarily a uniform thing across all different you know programs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was lucky enough to have available to me at least the a a sliver of a classics program, or at least what was a semi classics program when I started my undergrad and I kind of got grandfathered in to a track uh, that allowed me to pursue that in a way that pretty much anyone at my undergraduate who came after didn't really get to do. Um, so I pursued a, I, I, a bachelor's in history, um, which we uh, at the time I took on as an advisor, our one ancient history professor uh, who studied, he was a, a Romanist, but he also uh, was proficient in, in, in Greek history as well as ancient Greek language. He had his PhD in, uh, in, in classic classical literature from Chicago. And so he was, you know, 
very well credentialed in that manner. And then as well as I also per- uh, pursued a bachelor's in a, a, a degree track called humanities, which at the time that I started was split into three separate tracks. You could take a cultural studies track, which was kind of more of a like modern critical theory approach uh, to the study of like uh, more contemporary cultures and, and things like that. And one of the other options was this classically humanities track, which even when I started was already kind of dying. Um, although it was the most popular track at the time, uh, there was a movement within the professors in the departments as well as kind of just the leadership uh, to move it more towards a I, I, that, that critical theory uh, look and, they, and then they kind of rebranded that degree program after I went into the classical track uh, and, and became no longer like a humanities with a specialty in one of these things. It was just a degree in humanities and cultural studies, which what like, as I said, it was more of that uh, using critical theory to study contemporary cultures and whatnot. Uh, but because I, I had gotten into and joined that classical track, when I started, I was allowed to continue with that and get a degree specifically in classical humanities. And uh, in within that track, there was, and within the department, there was really only one professor who specialized in classics. So I pretty much just took as many of his courses as I could. And it was, you know, humanities of the ancient world, uh, looking at like classical idealism and classical art, uh, ancient religions, these sort of things, as well as reading a lot of classical literature. So uh, that's, that's pretty much how it came about. So I, uh, I, I wasn't in a traditional classics program in either, either one, the history or the humanities program, but it was like a sliver of a classics program that existed within these two departments. And, and I got to kind of like capitalize that and really pretty much focus all my studies on the ancient world while I was there. Yeah, I mean, you're you're actually really, really lucky that you were able to do that because I mean, in, in a lot of ways, I mean, I think that your story is probably more typical than somebody who gets to go to um, a university program that has a full-blown classics department in it with graduate students and so on and so forth, because that model, um, as we know, um, is sort of under attack and under threat. And it's exactly, you know, I, I think that your your story is going to be um, a common one. And I think that other people are going to, you know, who, who are going to listen to this um, and are, are interested in, you know, what's going on inside of the, uh, the world of humanities and classics on a college campus. Um, this is a story that gets repeated often is the, the idea that the, the classics part of whatever humanities department is sort of quietly being suffocated um, or killed or removed or whatever. And then this critical theory stuff is what ends up taking over. Um, and we're, uh, we're certainly going to talk about that, um, a little bit later. I, I actually, um, later on in this season, uh, this, uh, you know, season one that we're working on here on the podcast, I think we're going to have, um, a, a standalone episode that, that talks specifically about that, but, um, and we can get into that as much or as little as you like, but I mean, I, I, I also think that that's, it's, you know, it, it can it can very easily turn into the uh, the poor me podcast as opposed to you know talking about why you know this is a bad idea and why we should be defending this classic stuff a little bit more so right um, so on that note uh, you approach classics from like a history type background or from an interest in history which is great because um, again as we know uh, there's many ways to to pursue the classics it doesn't necessarily have to be from a history background but and there are people who do it um, from a language, you know, focus primarily. There are people who do it from an archaeology focus primarily. Um, but I think whenever you get involved in classics anyway, you sort of get exposed to all of it. Um, and I know that you actually did quite a bit of archaeology. So why, like, how exactly did that land on your plate and how did you pursue that? Yeah, that's actually, that was pro- uh, the times in my undergrad where I got to focus on archaeology and do that was one of the better moments of the, my entire educational experience, I'd say. Um, I, I got lucky again and 
in which the professor that uh, was the you know the the one that had in depth classics knowledge, the one that the uh, the degree in like classical literature and whatnot, was also uh, entwined into the Turkish archaeological scene more or less, and had worked on several different sites in Turkey, uh, in central Turkey and northern coastal uh, the, the the northern coast of Tur Turkey, right on the Black Sea. Um, and so, uh, when he, uh, when I kind of asked him to be my advisor and started taking ancient Greek language at one of the, um, uh, local private colleges, uh, he invited me to come with him on one of his, uh, newer digs that he had, had recently started working on in the last couple of years on a site called Philios, um, the, the Greek town was known as Teos um, in the ancient world, or Teos, uh, but the, the, it was the modern day city of Philios. It's a little beach town on the central northern coast of, of Turkey in the province of Zonguldak. And uh, basically went with him my first season. So we, he invited me onto this, in, onto this Turkish excavation. Uh, the, the plan was to, uh, to head out there the, the summer of 2016 during the, you know, the gap between spring and fall. Yeah. And we, uh, the day before we were supposed to fly out, what, and uh, if back in 2016, and it was, a, it was, there was a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, it was a tumultuous time in Turkey. And uh, the, the day before we flew out, uh, the terrorist attack on the Ataturk airport uh, occurred and so there was a we were supposed to have a large team but what ended up, a lot of the parents of the students ended up understandably back uh pulling their kids out of the excavation and it ended up just being me and a few others who who went uh so uh, we, we flew in a couple days after um and ended up um traveling around turkey for a while i got to see a lot of the major sites uh that you would want to see when you would go to turkey of course in istanbul you have you know the justinian's walls running through the city um you have you, you know the Hagia sophia uh we we traveled south on the coast down to ephesus and uh got to see there as well as a few other sites uh, which was a, an amazing experience, uh, especially since I hadn't really been exposed to the archaeological side of the ancient world to really travel to any of these places and being able to see these structures uh, that you only read about, really, in, in textbooks while you were in school. It was pretty fantastic. And so after we did some traveling around, we ended up going back uh, up north towards uh, to Zongladok and, and ended up uh, digging for about six weeks or so which was an awesome experience um but yeah that, that was the first season um we, and we ended up i ended up going back the the next two following years wow so you have not a you know you have quite a bit of archaeology experience then you know three years in Turkey. was this the first time that you had ever been out of the country or or you had been out of the out of the country before you've been overseas before I had been out of the country. I had not been over to Europe and mm -hmm. I had not been over to the mid Middle East or whatever you, I, I, I Turkey, depending on where you are in Turkey. Yeah. The, the near East, right. It's uh yeah. So, so, and, and how old are you at this point when, when we were, uh, when you're on this trip? Uh, I would have been 21 or 22. Perfect. Right. So this is a, this is a point that I like to make over and over again with, uh, with my own students um, when I'm talking to them is, you know, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too. And maybe, maybe you can relate to it, but I mean, I, I very vividly remember being like that age, you know, 20, 21, 22. And, you know, I came to classics late. We didn't have a classics department where I went to uh, undergraduate and I remember, you know, sort of dreaming about, you know, uh, the the idea of uh, I, like having an adventure, you know, where like they're going to one day they're going to call me, you know, like uh, ninjas are going to kill my family and I'm going to have to, you know, they're going to tap me in. And they're going to be like, all right, it's your time, you know. 
And, uh, and in a, in a lot of ways, um, when you get involved in archeology, span I mean, it's, it's kind of that, you know, I mean, because you're, you know, it's not, it's not normal, um, to go to places like this and, and you are exposing yourself to stuff like, you know, the, the terrorist attack in, uh, at, at a Turk airport and you're exposing yourself to, you know, different parts of the world that might be, you know, rougher than what we're used to in the United States. And, you know, so, um, what did it feel like? I mean, when you were, you know, you know, is it, is it like, were you sitting there, you know, are you afraid? Are you, is it like nervous, but like good nervous or, are, you know, are you think, are you thinking to yourself at 21, man, this is it. I'm finally getting my, you know, my shot here to have the, uh, the grand adventure. Uh, I honestly didn't know how to feel about it at the time. It felt so foreign to me and almost like I was in a movie. <laughs> like landing in the airport, uh, the air, just the getting into the airport experience and the added sort of um, uh, effect of, of seeing the bullet holes still all over the walls and the explosion, uh, like burn marks on the, on the metal and the sea of bags that were, that were left from the people that were, you know, unfortunately, brutally murdered. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um it 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 was a very weird introduction into this like new sort of um uh perspective shifting experience that I was about to have uh, coming from the United States and being incredibly, you know, sort of insulated and safe and especially in this era that we've I've grown up in. Um, and then like walking, like my first introduction into that, just like landing into this, like almost war-torn airport that I'd just been attacked. Um, and, and, and so that was kind of a, an interesting experience and it was like a weird introduction to it, but it quick, the, the experience quickly shifted to, into a less dreary and, 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 and kind of like sorrow filled to a more like, uh, like, um, exciting and, very like awe inspiring experience very quickly. Um, so, you know, after you get out of the airport and you get in one of the taxis and learning just enough Turkish so that they, they aren't quite questioning whether or not you know it or not, or whether they're going to be able to, <laughs> you know, take you somewhere else to maybe charge you a little bit more or something, you know, and uh, all right, we'll cut that part out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man, that that's pretty, this is dynamite stuff. I mean, yeah. like it's, you know, but I mean, you know, the, the, the reason, the reason why I'm asking, right. About, about the, you know, the adventure aspect is that, you know, it is, it is easy, you know, for, for students. And I think even for my own students that I, that I see that I'm teaching, but I mean, you know, not even, not even that. I just, I just like, if you try and take the temperature of the internet, which is maybe not a great idea, but I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of people on the internet and a lot of kids that are, that are, you know, the age that you were then, you know, in their late teens, early twenties and stuff. And, you know, it can be very like soul destroying, you know, going to college, um, and, and getting there and realizing that like, this is what it is to be a finance major, you know? And, and it's like, you know, I don't know. There's only so many, um, there's only so many like, you know, frat parties that you can go to, you know, before you sit there and you start saying to yourself, man, I mean, was this, is this it? Is this, is this what it is to, you know, to get a, to get a four-year degree? I mean, what, when do I get to do anything cool? Right. And the answer is, you know, if you're a finance major, you know, may, maybe never. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, right. But I mean, if you're, if all of a sudden you're doing classics, you're doing archeology, span you know, or you're doing marine biology or you're doing something interesting, um, you can Right. But it sort of feels like it's a well-guarded like secret, you know, like, like people aren't, you know, how did your parents react? You know, speaking of which, I mean, did they, did you, <laughs> when, when you told them like, you know, that's it, I'm, I'm going to do classics. I mean, did they, did they cry? Did they, you know, get into a fight with you? Was there yelling and screaming or were they supportive? Were they one of those, you know, rare instances where they were like, go for it. I mean, how did it go? So it, that's actually an interesting, um, I guess, situation in which I, and this kind of ties into what I'm doing now. Um, I was fortunate enough to get a job at Apple 
uh, while I was in college. Mm worked there for about three years or so. And with that job came a lot of benefits. And one of them was that it was paying for my school. And they paid a significant amount of money per year uh, towards my education, and which pretty much allowed me to not have to take out any student loans between the working and, the, and then the reimbursements from them. It allowed me to kind of pursue college without really worrying about money all that much. Um, even they even paid for my ancient Greek language courses at a private school that were absorb exorbitantly expensive. Um, and uh, so my parents, although they, I'm sure they were kind of confused as to why I would want to do something like classics as opposed to something like engineering or, you know, a, a, sci a pursue some like medical school or something like that. Uh, they were very supportive of it because it really wasn't it, there. There was not a whole ton of downside. Right. It was if I ended up getting this degree or these degrees and not doing anything with it, which. Yeah, we could, well, we'll get into that later. <laughs> sure. I ended up probably not really doing all mm -hmm. that much with it after the fact. Um, it wasn't going to put me in financial ruin or put me in a position where I'd be paying it back for the next 15 years. I was kind of do doing an experiment in a, like a life experience experiment and seeing if this was going to pay off in, a, in like other ways that weren't financial. And it, it definitely has. Uh, but but because I think it wasn't going, they knew that this wasn't going to put me in financial ruin. They were very supportive of the of the fact that I was pursuing something that I at least, you know, it, at least it seemed to them that I was incredibly interested in, which I was for yeah. and, and still am. Yeah, that's 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 again that's interesting because it's it's almost like, you know, <laughs> not not to to use a a cliched you know kind of phrase here, right? But uh, you know, caveat emptor is uh is the 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 famous expression right let the buyer beware and it's sort of true right that you 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 can sort of get into financial straits or or financial difficulty you know really regardless of what major you pick if you're not really careful about it um and that's that's another one of those things that i i i i've heard this complaint a lot um of of late you know where people are sort of you know they're, they're getting, you know, sort of throwing their hands up in the air going like, well, you know, what's the point, you know, college is too expensive and it's going to ruin me financially and it's going to do this. And, I, you know, and it's not going to, I'm not going to be able to like do anything with my degree to recoup the cost. And, you know, um, this, uh, this sort of goes into, um, the companion episode, uh, to this, uh, to this episode, uh, which is a standalone by itself. If you haven't heard the companion episode, episode one, um, you might want to go back and listen to it just because we, I, I do sort of talk about this subject. Um, and it is an important subject too. I mean, it's, you know, you shouldn't really, um, casually make these decisions to go in, into Hawk for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. You know, uh, I, I'm this, I'm going to go to Harvard because, um, I want to say that I'm a Harvard grad and it's going to cost me a hundred thousand dollars that I don't have, you know, and I don't really want to, you know, I'm not really sure what I want to study. You know, that it's like already you're sort of, you know, you're not doing it right. You know, <laughs> as opposed as opposed to finding somebody to pay for you to do whatever it is, and you know, and 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 there are, you know, it is possible to to do it. You know, even though it it might be a little bit challenging and tricky, but absolutely, know. yeah. If you want to pursue it, and it's something that's really that important to you, or it's something that you want to at least try. Uh, and and pursue and, and see if you like it, then there's tons of opportunities out there for you to find someone to to pay for it. It's like whether it's through scholarships or through grants or through working. And I I know there's often a resistance to working during college. Um, and, you know, like people want the full college experience or whatever that means to them. Uh, but in reality, I think it, it what working in while doing school not only gives you the benefits of you can work through play, even places like Starbucks now will pay for uh, your school up to a certain amount. So it, there's not there's there are tons there's tons of them out there. Uh, they they publicly list whether or not they do it, and you can find one of these jobs and take advantage of it in a way that 
that will give you life experience that's going to like be way, way better and way more significant and impact you in ways that like having the college experience by going to, uh, you know, as many frat parties as you can, as you can handle will not give you right. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, it, it's a very like hollow kind of pursuit to do that. And, and I think, I think that people do get really, they do get really burned out. And I, I I've, I've met, you know, I, I've met people traveling solo, um, I, which is something that I used to do when I was, you know, really doing archeology, span um, you know, every year I, I always, I, you know, and, and maybe you did this as well. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I mean, I, I always used to try to, to, to sneak in a little solo travel, you know, either before or after the project. And whenever I did, you know, you're staying in hostels and stuff and, you know, you'll meet, I, I, remember, I used to bump into kids who were, you know, coming from a, a summer or they, they're on summer break and they're, they're coming from their, you know, wherever their university is. And, you know, just listening to their, you know, complaints about like, you know, what, what, what it is, what it is to go through college, you know, in this, uh, in, in the modern day here. And, 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 you know, I, I can, I, I understand. I mean, I understand that it's, it, it is very hollow and it, it, it can be very hollow and it can be very like meaningless, you know, unless you, unless you, unless you're a little proactive as you were. Right. Yeah. So, so, um, so speaking of, um, like, the impact that something that a trip like this or a project like this does have on you. Um, can you, can you give me a couple of examples um, of, of maybe impactful finds or impactful experiences that, you know, you got to go through and it doesn't necessarily have to be positive or negative or anything, just impactful, you know, things that stick with you, you know, from, uh, from your experience overseas and doing that, you know, anything jump out at you? Yeah, uh, I would say anytime you're traveling to a different country that has different social norms and different social dynamics, different like uh, different laws, and, and especially these countries that have cultures that are thousands and thousands of years old, um, it it opens your perspective and understanding of the world of the world in a way that I don't think anything else can. Like uh, you could read as many books as you want, and of course that is incredibly helpful. Uh, you know, you can you can talk to people from those places, but unless you go there and experience it, it it, it you'll never get that same impact, and it really does change you in ways and and open your your mind to different ideas in a way that nothing else really does. Um, and so there it's it's kind of impossible to name like uh, to pick just a, a couple like uh, I would the most significant moments in the, these trips that uh, that you know, were um, left impressions on me or changed me in significant ways because the whole experience really did. Um, uh, and uh, in almost every aspect of it, and, and not only uh, traveling to Turkey, but in living in Turkey, but also in Italy as well, uh, digging in Italy during grad school, uh, did that in different ways. But I would say uh, some of the most significant experiences I had during the Turkish excavations. One of them was finding uh, somewhere close to 30 skeletons behind a uh, Byzantine church. It was, it was, I think it was uh, a, an 11th century, 12th century Byzantine church that we found on the Acropolis of the Tios site. Um, and around the back of this of this church, we found rough close to 30 skeletons and being able to like slowly uncover these skeletons and finding jewelry and, you know, ornamentation. And, and even we even found a, a lady that must have died while she was pregnant. So having like the, the child skeleton on top of her stomach and stuff was it impacted it made, you know, more it's <laughs> made like the, the life cycles of these people seem more real and 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 like you know, it even made your, your own perception of your, uh, of your own mortality seem more like, you know, pr ever present. And, and like, it's easier to understand when you're like sitting there looking at these skeletons that are a thousand years old and, and thinking about generations of people that came before you. Like it's, it's one thing when you uh, read about, 
you know, when oh, this guy was alive in the first century, right? And and you're speaking about it, and you have this certain idea and this certain perspective about what about what two thousand years means, and what that feel and like what that would be like, and and your perception of time is is kind of like uh, is is really trapped within the context of your own life. And so if you if you're you know if I was twenty one years old you know, all of life is really only 21 years old to me. And, and, and it's impossible to understand what 2000 years really is, even if I tried to tell myself being a cocky 21 year old guy, that I, I, I understood this, and I really understood the ancient world and all of this. But when you're like holding the skeleton of someone that really died a 1000 years ago, it really, it, it changes the way you think about it. And it, it's very interesting. And so I say that was probably one of the most significant and uh, one of the other uh, significant moments was when uh, my uh, uh, advisor, professor and I went to do a, 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 a survey of the harbor that was uh, right next to the Acropolis of this site. This kind of had this jutting aisle that stuck out um, this landmass, and on top of that was the Acropolis of the city. And then down off the side of it, there was a, a large harbor, ancient harbor that used to be there. The stones from the harbor are, are still in the water, but you know, no one really knew what remains were there. And we ended up going on a three hour scuba survey of just swimming around this harbor. And within you know those three hours, uncovered somewhere close to eight to 10 uh, ships that had, were like sunken underneath this harbor. Who, I, we don't, we, it would be impossible to really know at this point since they haven't been uncovered what they dated back to, but my professor assumed some of them even dating back to the early Roman empire or uh, sorry, uh, like, yeah, I would say the, the early Roman empire, first, second, third century. Wow, wow, that's, that, that'll ring your bell. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's crazy. That's really crazy. So, wow. So, okay. So now take me through the, uh, the thought process here. Okay. So you, you do what, what year in school are you when you, when you have all these experiences, this is like your second year, third year in school or, or thereabouts or. Yeah. The first, my first season out there was my second or third year, uh, somewhere in between. So um, I took it. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 go, go on, go on. No, I was going to say, I, the, I'm tr I don't know exactly just because I, I did five years for my undergrad because I did a uh, honors degree for my um, history, tra uh, my history bachelor's. And, and so that I had to take an extra half year, full year for the, 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 the thesis I wrote. But I think yeah. it was second into third year. So, okay. So, so you're, you're sort of, you know, in the middle of a, of a degree at that point, when you start to have these, you know, when this starts to actually, you know, come into your life in this way and you, you know, you realize, obviously this is super cool. I want to go back. I want to keep doing it. Um, did you ever have any second thoughts at that point? Were you thinking to yourself, you know, man, when I graduate, I don't really know what I'm going to do, you know, and then how do you make, how do you finally settle on the decision for grad school in, you know, and, and more of, of what you were, what you had, you know, been doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when I, it was kind of easy to continue falling into it as, as once I started the archaeological experience or started having these archaeological experiences because they were so eye-opening and so, um, perspective shifting that I couldn't at that point while I was in them and living these things and like talking to other people who were like, you know, during their summers, just going out drinking and, and, and partying around or just like going back home and staying with their parents or, or something like that. It, it was almost impossible for me to see myself doing anything else at that moment. So it was pretty easy at that time to uh to continue falling into it and wanting to do more and more because it was just it was a it felt like an experience that uh, i wasn't going to get anywhere else and it was going to be something that i could hold it as a significant moment and and phase of my life for the rest of my life right in a way that i don't think college would have been if i didn't do that so it, it, it on for so being able to do that 
having the job at Apple that kept me financially sound, um, which allowed me to continue pursuing these things. And they were incredibly gracious with their, uh, uh, with working around my school schedule and, um, and uh, allowing me to take time during the summer to go to Turkey uh, to, uh, to do these things. I was just in such a position where everything was kind of funneling me into it. And uh, there wasn't really anything dragging me away there. It, everyone was encouraging me. I was one of the only uh, um, students pursuing ancient history and, and classics. And, and so it was, it, there didn't really seem like drawbacks at the, at the time. Um, and so as I continued having these experiences and continuing, fu- you know, getting funneled into them and, and, and like having all of these, uh, you know, life altering events, basically, uh, or at least perspective altering events, uh, I knew that I wanted to at least try grad school. I, I knew that like it, it wasn't going to hurt if I just gave it two years for a master's degree and then figured it out after that right I, it, it seemed to me like I had gotten this far not in debt having these amazing experiences and I also had all of this experience in the IT world now working at Apple that you know worst case scenario if I didn't want to pursue the PhD and go the full academic route that I could go back to full IT full-time IT and um and pursue that um and so I just uh, decided to to go in for it. And as as you know, and as you've touted the um, the uh, the benefits and 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 the um, the upsides of the Florida State program, um, one of the I, I I was told by our our mutual friend Lidio mm-hmm. uh, about this about this uh, classics program at Florida State that was you know very well renowned as well as being fully funded. And uh, so as soon as I got accepted to that program, found I didn't have to go into any debt for grad school. In fact, they were going to pay you, uh, and then you would also get the experience of teaching your own courses at the university level um i knew i just it was worth the two-year investment right like even if i didn't end up doing anything with it uh having that experience uh was going to be worth more than you know any two years work experience that i could get in that in that immediate term so yeah yeah it seemed like an easy decision yeah. So, okay. So, and I remember, I remember very vividly, actually, when you came to Florida State to, uh, to, you know, during the uh, perspective weekend, uh, you know, for those um, listening who aren't really familiar with the, um, the, the grad school uh, admissions process, it, it, typically speaking, what happens is that, you know, you make your application, you're talking to admi- an admissions officer, usually it's somebody in the department who's in charge of it. And it's like a rotating thing. Um, and then they'll have a weekend where, you know, all of the prospective students who they're going to make an offer to um, will come up and, you know, with, there's lectures and, you know, maybe not in recent years just because of the COVID situation. But, you know, usually it's like in-person lectures. Um, it, it oftentimes will coincide with, a, uh, with a, an annual um, lecture series that we have at Florida State called the Langford um, series of, uh, of lectures. Um, which I believe is when I when I first met you, right? Was during the Langford that um, that year. It was a it was a big graduate conference, um, and then and then we'll have you know social stuff where we get to go and you talk to current students and PhD students and you know and find out what the culture of the program is like and so on and so forth. So um, so what was your? I mean, I remember my impression, but what was your impression of uh, Florida State when you first got there? When you you know on that on that first trip, you know, in the the weekend the prospective students weekend. Yeah. So, uh, going even though, uh, Orlando and Tallahassee are technically in the same state, they do not <laughs> feel the same whatsoever. Orlando is a very, which is where I went to undergrad. Uh, it, Orlando is a very mo- like more modernized, uh, I would say like new construction, uh, sort of metropolitan, like melting pot area with all of these different cultures and peoples and stuff coming from all over the world, of course, for Disney and Universal and those sort of things, but, but still. Um, and UCF, my undergraduate 
um, university was very modern, like uh, lots of new buildings. There was always new constructions. It was basically like a city. It was it was it was huge. And, and Matt, I mean, I think it's either the one number one or number two usually uh, most populated uh, universities in the United in the world or in the United States. One of the two, I can't remember, uh, but they always go back and forth with I think Arizona State or or something something like that. And so going to FSU um, and seeing this like much, these much older buildings and this like very Southern style brick and, and whatnot, it felt way more academic, I would say. Like, like uh, going, it, it felt way more like what you would think if you were going to a university, you know, I don't know, like- Like, like a university ago. in a movie or something, right? Exactly, like it's, yeah, I yeah. Okay, it's yeah. like people study here, right? It's yeah. like at yeah. UCF, it was like, there seemed like there were science-y things going on, right? Like there was definitely a lot of STEM, like there was experiments, all that sort of thing. But when you show up at FSU, you, it gives you this sense that you're like almost in, you know, England during the 19th century, like, like with these big stained glass windows and these beautiful brick buildings and all this. And, and so it, it felt very academic and, and I appreciated that. And especially that kind of shift into, into FSU. And then uh, we, we, we uh, were lucky enough to have probably the prettiest building uh, get, you know, given to the classics department uh, in the, on the entire campus. And so this, it's Dodd Hall had these, you know, this beautiful library and, you know, like these, you know, huge vaulted gilded ceilings and stuff. And, and it was, it was a gorgeous building and uh, it, it just felt like where you would study classics, right? Like it, it felt like you should have a bust of Augustus, which you did next to you <laughs> Yes. <laughs> while, you know, <laughs> while you were reading Cicero, right? Like it, it, it all kind of like felt like what you should be doing there so um it, it was nice and it was very kind of enchanting um uh, during my first experience and, and so yeah i've kind of fell in love with it pretty immediately yeah so 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 right away i i think it's safe to say you know because i had a very similar um a very you know i was i was similarly impressed i should say you know when i first came up to uh to look at dodd hall and and where the classics department is in, uh, at FSU, it's, I mean, it really makes an impression and it leaves you with, you know, with this, you know, sort of, you know, I don't know. I, I, I was, I was very intimidated when I first came up and I was thinking to myself, man, I, I hope one day I'm cool enough to like sit down and study in Dodd Hall and I'm, I can like, you know, I could be like a real classicist reading Latin, you know, and of course, and of course, whenever, you know, whenever we start, um, working on these ancient languages, you know, I think there's there, that's that's another you know you know issue that we face inside of the classics is is exactly how difficult it is to do this in the first place and how difficult the subject matter is, um, especially given that you know most of us don't have any training on any of this stuff before we get to undergraduate, um, which is you know a, a major change from the way that classics used to be taught. I mean this 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 subject was so elementary you know, in, in, you know, years and, and I, I should say centuries past, right. That, you know, you would start studying Greek and Latin when you were in your, you know, your grade school days, um, which we definitely don't do now. Um, so, <laughs> so, so, I mean, was, was the, were the demands of the program, did it surprise you at all? Or was there anything, you know, were there, were there moments where you're sitting there and you're really going through, you know, the ringer, the academic ringer, and you're saying to yourself, man, why did I do this? Or, you know, were there any moments of like, you know, regret or were there any moments of, you know, frustration um, <laughs> once you got going? Uh, I would say there was definitely moments of all of those. And one of the things that any academic, especially a classicist will tell you is that if you don't have those, then you're not in the right program, right? Like, uh, and, and FSU ver held a very high standard for what they expected out of the students and reasonably so they're, it's fully funded. They're paying you to be there. You're, they're allowing you to teach courses for them. Like they expect a very high level of academic excellence. And 
not that I didn't have it in the in my undergrad, um, but it wasn't enforced in the same way because I wasn't in classics programs, right? I was in a history program that had some classics, uh, like uh, that that you had like so somewhat of a classics track that you can kind of follow, and I was in humanities program that had somewhat of a classics track you can you could follow, but there was no like you know, you need to sight read Herodotus in Greek. <laughs> and if you don't get it at 90% accuracy, you fail, right? Like there wasn't right. any of that. And so it was kind of like my Greek courses, there was three of us and we were all interested in Greek and classics, but there it was, it was an undergrad course and there was only three of us. So the standard was kind of set by how well we were doing and not necessarily a, a, like a, um, a, a standard set by like a uh, comprehensive exam or something like that. And we, so you kind of just did it as well as you could, you learned as much as you could. Um, and, and that was good. That was good enough. And uh, there wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a standard really in which that was hard set that you really had to achieve, right? Like you had to work hard, but like, you know, if, if you couldn't sight read Thucydides, you know, funeral oration, then it's okay. It's not that big of a deal, right? Like you're still going to get a good grade. And, and so getting, so that transition from this like very kind of romantic study of the ancient world in which you like, it's really all fun and games in a sense uh, to this hardcore, uh, like demanding uh, academically rigorous program, um, especially for someone who didn't come from a like classic full classics backgrounds uh was, was definitely a stark change and you know i remember and you as you probably remember you know spending upwards of between work and 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 school like 70 to 80 hours a week every week we just you know sometimes reading greek for eight hours a day just so you can be prepared for the next class like was something that i just was not used to at first and 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 definitely took a long time to get used to and lots of swearing and, 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 you know, and, and heartfelt conversations over beer. Okay. So, um, so you mentioned, you know, what it's like to sit and have, you know, and, and grind like that. Um, and it is, you know, and I, I sort of wonder about this. I go back and forth about it all the time where I go, you know, does, does this field attract people who are already disciplined or does it make you more disciplined, you know, as a result of doing it? Because, you know, if you want to continue, there's nothing for it. You just have to develop the discipline to be able to sit down and, and study for a long period of time, you know, or is it, or, or is it the fact that, you know, that there are people who have a higher tolerance for that and, and that some people, you know, can grind better than other people can. Um, and I, you know, the reason I, I, I think about that a lot, um, is because, you know, just, just having been through, you know, lots of, you know, academic suffering at this point in my own life, um, you know, I, I got to wonder, you know, do, where, where did I, was I able to sit down and, and work on Greek and Latin for, you know, eight to 10 hours a day, every day for years on end, because I'm a crazy person, you know, and I walked in that way and I just had a proclivity to be able to sit and do this stuff for a long time. Or was it that, you know, I was just so enamored with the idea of doing it, you know, and, and, and also sort of like motivated to, to not fail at it, you know, that it, it gave me the, you know, the, that's where I found the motivation to do it. And I'm not sure in myself, but I mean, what do you think? You know, I, I know that you, you also, you know, had a, a pretty hefty um, sports background, which requires its own kind of discipline. So, I mean, but what do you think? Uh, I think both are can be true or both are true. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you come in disciplined, that level of workload is not something that seems unattainable to you. Like if if already the idea of working eight to twelve hours a day on a language that you really can't use anywhere else, right? Um, <laughs> Except for uh, you doing graded trivia nights and whatnot, but yeah, um, sure. <laughs> um, 
if if the, if like that amount of time commitment to something is something that is not already it, that's not foreign to you then the the tract doesn't seem as scary and and so it's something that it would attract people who know about it right that know the level of workload that studying classics really is um it, it wouldn't deter those people and then on top of that the people who are casually interested and then find out they're extremely interested and then find out you know what it takes to to do that uh uh and like classics is a way of sort of like um tempering yourself and like and hardening yourself to uh be able to handle that those levels of workloads right because there is no faking it unfortunately <laughs> that would have made <laughs> the, the process much easier right like yeah when, when you're sitting in class and uh like you know you're reading through lysias and the and they're you're pulling up a passage that you that you wasn't assigned and the teacher says all right austin like read lines you know 40 through 80 right like if you didn't spend you know 12 hours a day every day for the last two months reading lysias you're just simply not going to do it and then you have to sit around the table uh, at a table with people all around you that did do it and are looking at you like why do you get to be here you know and, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, and and so it kind of like it like if you're not already disciplined and not already used to investing that time of time that amount of time and effort into something it can harden you and 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 like get you to be able to do that and like instill that level of ethic in you that like you know the, it takes hard work to achieve here and like there is no shortcuts right like yeah yeah. So I think and, and both, both can definitely be true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's, that's actually, that's sort of nice when you put it that way, because I mean, it, it does, it does sort of, you know, sidestep the question a little bit, you know, and, and it's, and it's probably true, you know, that it is, it is a little from column A and a little from column B, you know, it's like, it takes a certain personality to want to do it. And then once you actually start doing it, it, it does actually change the way that you approach, you know, work or, or, or difficult tasks in general. Um, and it's true, you know, going back to, you know, that idea of things being like feeling hollow or feeling like, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of meaning that you derive from them. You know, that is one of those things that I think, um, is, is a subtle, you know, kind of killer, um, especially for kids that are of that age, you know, in their late teens, early twenties, where, you know, if you have them jump through a series of meaningless hoops that are not really all that challenging, you know, you get to the end of it and you're like, you know, what did I even do? You know, where it's like, you know, when you get to the end of Lysias and, and you and you do have the skill and you can sit down and, and just pick this stuff up and, you know, and they're and they are, you know, they're 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 making you nuts. You know, who, whatever your professor is, is, you know you know, sitting there and asking you, all right, all right, you know, parse that, what's the participle, you know, what's the, you know, and on and on and on. And you can do it, you know, you're like, damn, I'm, I'm in the matrix, right? You know, you're like, you know, and it is, it is like a, like an inherently satisfying thing to sit back and be like, man, you know, I really, I really did it, you know? Yeah. So that's, so speaking of, of the, you know, the, I, I guess the reason I, I, I started this line of questioning is to say that, you know, I know, especially as time went on, you know, and, and, you know, we spent many, you know, hours studying together, you know, for Greek and whatever else. And we had many, many conversations about, you know, life and work and, you know, what we're going to do after and, you know, what's going to happen and so forth. And, you know, you actually had a great, um, interesting idea, uh, you know, towards, I, I mean, you know, I think you were, you were even conceiving of this you know, towards the middle of the, of your, um, your masters. Um, but then you sort of got more serious about it as time went on. Um, so, you know, take me through your thought process about like, you know, what your, what your plan for after grad school was and how you went about it and what, you know, what were, what, you know, what, what were all the options you were looking at and, you know, et cetera, you know, take me through the whole thing. So about halfway through the program, um, I had, I had had another like fantastic 
archaeological experience. I, I instead of Turkey this time, uh, one of the sites that uh, the the one of the FSU archaeologists dug at partnered with Princeton was this uh, site uh, Coza in Italy, and it was uh, by uh, Al Albania. Um, and sort of like coastal Tuscany and it was uh it was an amazing experience like the the, the difference and contrast between digging in Turkey and digging in Italy was like night and day it, it was like this crazy oh significantly more relaxed but also like oh well it, it seemed felt like more I would say um more academic but in like less kind of uh uh, mechanical I, that's the only I guess would be it was less sure. about the process of digging and more about like the the pieces that we were finding and, and, and things and it was it was it, it was a very interesting situation and that might have just been because of the site I was at was large in Turkey was largely you know un, um, covered and, and so there's a lot more digging and stuff to be had but um, my experience at Koza uh, was was very different, especially since this was a a long excavated site that had been you know a, a project for a significant amount of time, and so there was a lot of you know um, stuff built up around it, and, and a lot of books already written on it, and, and things like that. But uh, I had a great experience there, um, but kind of saw the writing on the wall for um my career in classics and it, it came as this feeling of like I was sitting at the table with all these people around me that were like incredibly intelligent um they were very well versed not only in the ancient languages but in all of the accompanying languages that you have to know to be a classicist it's not that you can just know greek and latin but you have to know french and german and, and italian and uh, i was looking at this you know uh, down the barrel of another seven to ten years to do a phd before i could even really get a a job that would be able to uh you know pay me to live at somewhat uh, like middle class standard of living, um, and was kind of and looking at this and looking at these people I was competing against, and realized that I kind of got everything that I wanted out of classics already at to this point, right? Like I had these these awesome worldly experiences. I was like I went through the trenches of like learning these languages that like 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 as you said like really builds character in a sense where you you walk into this thing that looks completely foreign to you at first and and seems like unreachable impossible to understand and over the course of a year like slowly chipping away at it and then being that person person and reading it and, and like being the person that you were a year ago sitting in class and looking at and being like i'll never get there right like i'll never understand in the way that guy understands it and being and like at, sitting in that seat and like being able to be that person and then like you know having that experience and so i got you know the character building aspect out of it i got the knowledge i, I wanted out of it right like i uh, and like i had read all the all the the classical text i had read all the you know the authors and the plays and the poetry and i had done all of this stuff already and it felt like to me that if I went further, it would just be going further nuanced, like uh, like learning the nuances of these things that I already felt like I kind of understood, right? And and to me, I I, I didn't see a path forward for me down this track, and it was okay. Like I I was okay with it, and I had accepted it, right? And um, I I didn't regret it. I, I I had like these amazing experiences. I got what I wanted out of it, but I knew for myself that it was time to move on. It, it was time to move on to like learn a skill that would like, you know, contribute materially to the world or, you know, add resource, like, can, you know, be able to make a living for myself, be able to, you know, like support a family, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, during this entire time I was in grad school, I was, uh, I was doing IT work still um which was part of the reason it was one of the reasons it was quite difficult is I, I was still do, I was doing all of this at the same time uh working anywhere from you know part-time to full-time and all of that doing that and it was uh being able to like maintain and 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 like 
and like had that backup plan like uh and like saw the potential that you what you could like earn and like the possibilities within the IT world um I knew that uh I wanted to start moving that way um and and so I found that I like the with the classics program and the IT uh stuff it gave me like a unique combination of skill sets that uh, I don't think a lot of people would have. Um, and I started to get a, a, a almost a, I guess you could say a, a call of, call to duty. I don't know if like, this is something that a lot of young men experience or a lot of young women as well, where you, you have the sense that you want to serve the country in some way, right? Like I, I just, I had the sense that I was like enjoying the fruits of society you know, being this this basically paid brain to think about the ancient world, but I wasn't really giving back in a way that I thought was like um, really substantial at this point in my life. And I thought that, you know, I could keep learning about classics and studying classics and, you know, expanding my, my knowledge base and all of that, but while learning skills that I could actually use to, to, to give back. And, and so I, I had a couple of paths forward. Uh, one of the first paths that I uh, decided I wanted to try to pursue was working for one of the three letter agencies and working in intelligence. And uh, so I decided to pursue that for a while. And so I, I had gone through, uh, like, um, started, you know, uh, trying to cultivate skill sets that would benefit me in that realm. I tailored a lot of my studies towards things that were related to history and intelligence in the ancient world. So I was basically studying the ancient world of spies and, and, and all of that and, and clandestine war activities and, and things like that. And um from that, tried to continue to gear toward in that direction. And uh, I, that led me down a path in, in, in which I, I realized that like, it, there was possibilities really outside of like using my classics degree purely to become a classics professor, right? Mm -hmm. Like I could use, I could use like these, this like grit that I had developed this, like this mentality of, 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 of like utilizing hard work to achieve and and then on top of that, this like inquisitive nature that you develop while studying classics and, and uh, you know, in these, in these like mind altering, life expanding ex uh, perspective experience, ex perspective expanding experience you get from doing the archaeology and all of this and, you know, sort of like, you know, international under like understanding of the world that you develop and uh, tailoring it towards you know, various, various things. And, and, and I realized you just didn't have to only be an armchair academic, like you could do pretty much anything you wanted, as long as you just develop those skill sets too, right. And, and the thing about the the grit and the, and the rigor of the classics program is that it, it allows you to realize that you can acquire those skill sets and, and, and cultivate them. Yeah, it's not it's not job training, right? It's not it's not a, it's not a it's not vocational school. Right. Uh, it's not, you know, but then again, like none of it is right. And it never was. And it was never it never was supposed to, you know, that wasn't the intention of of the of the university, you know, capital U. Right. Like the you know, the idea of the university was not to, you know, reduce um somebody's education into like a uh, to to like sort of sort them ever more narrowly into whatever category um that they're going to get sorted into based on you know what classes you took in your second year of undergrad right i mean so and and that is that is one of the most pervasive thoughts out there but it's also one of the most i think again i'm going to say the i'm going to use the, the the hyperbole here right the the most soul destroying and soul sucking ideas you know that you can take away from your educational experience is that I went to school to do X, you know, when in reality, you know, you don't, it doesn't work that way. Right. Um, so, so, you know, you, so you had, you know, you were sort of pursuing several different options, you know, while you were still in grad school. And I think you, you settled on 
this idea of doing, you know, something that was maybe a little bit more in demand um, and something that was going to be a little bit, you know, you know, maybe better paying, more stable, this kind of stuff. Um, but that wasn't a picnic either, right? That's not like a, it's not like you just roll out of bed one day uh, and, and then you say, you know what, I want to make, you know, six figures and I'm going to do it, you know, and, and I'm going to do it fast and easy, right? So, so, so what exactly did you, did you end up settling on? And, 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 and then how did you figure out what to do? Like, how did you figure out what steps you were going to take to make this idea like happen? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess to begin uh, on this, this story and this journey, I, I, it really like my story is it, it, at least if, if you take any like inspiration from it is one that like you, one of the lessons you should learn or you should think, or one of those perspectives that you should consider is that work like working while you're in school is good like it's not bad like more work if you can handle it is better for you right like being able like being able to like sit on the couch and watch tv for hours every night is significantly less important than like developing your character and like by forcing yourself to work while you're in school and ha and handle as many responsibilities as possible, it develops you in. It first of all allows you to handle more, and then it also like develops you in like it, it makes you a more well-rounded and developed person, right? And 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 it allows you to kind of like handle the obstacles of life in a way that, if you are constantly like insulating yourself from stress and from you know, hard work and, and from all of in challenges and all of this that you will never really develop. Um, which I, I think is like a, an attitude that a lot of people take on is that they, they, they want to kind of lower the amount of responsibility or lower the amount of stress so that they can handle what's going on. And it's like, if it's truly too much, I agree with you. But if, if you're really, if you're only working, you know, four hours a day, like, can you, is it really too much? You know, like, <laughs> can, like can you handle, and for some people it may be right. But yeah. like, I think for most, it, you could, you can really take on more and the more you take on. Yeah. And, and by the way, j just to cut you off here for a second, by the way, I'm totally guilty of that. You know, when, when, when I, when I was, when I was a, you know, really when I was, I, I, I had a way of getting in my own head, especially, you know, in the undergrad years where I was like, you know, it's, I, I, I really feel like I'm working too much. I feel like I'm doing too much. I feel like I can't handle this. I feel like, you know, this, I feel like that, but you know, in retrospect, it wasn't that I was doing too much. It was that I didn't really give a shit about what I was doing. Right. And, and it, and it was just, it was like the misapplication of the labor, you know, was really the problem. And once you start pointing it at something that you do care about, all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, I, you know, I can work all day long and, you know, and then all night long too. And who cares? And, you know, and you, and you, you know, you, you sort of relish, you know, finding new ways, but, but, you know, continue with your story though. I, I don't mean to cut you off. Oh, no. And I think that's perfect. And I think that really is a good add on to my little rant there is that like, <laughs> if you are spend, if you are, you know, exerting tremendous amounts of effort into avenues that you don't derive value from, and that you aren't interested in, then it truly is too much work, right? Because like, your your time should be spent, like intelligently, and you should be gaining value in some capacity from everything that you're doing uh, as as much as you are able right of course there's certain things you always just have to do as as part of life tasks to to do but if you're pursuing careers you don't enjoy or you're pursuing you know studies you're not interested in then it's just not worth your time and not worth the extra effort but if you are doing all of that right and taking on more is not going to you know, affect your performance in the other regard, right? And and not not like, and you have to look at this reasonably, right? Like you you could say like, oh, I mean, it's going to affect my performance if I'm you know slightly more tired now, and I choose now to be more lazy, uh, like on my assignments, and and therefore it's affecting it, so I need to do less. Like that's one thing. But if like given your actual hundred percent effort, 
and be like giving as much as you can if taking on more is is something that you can do then i think you should and it's like it, it, especially in these like early years of your life while you're you know trying to like become a contributing member of society and, and and learn about the world and and like you know develop skills that will you know carry you on through the rest of your life i think it's it's important that you should you know pursue as many things as you reasonably can yeah you know without affecting the the, the ones that you're already pursuing i guess right the way no i yeah. think i think you're 100 percent right so Okay, so yeah. so yeah. so back into the actual, go back, yeah, because yeah, because tell us what did you actually end up pursuing? Because I mean, it is yeah. it's fascinating. I mean, but but continue, yeah. please. Yeah, so all of that rant was to say, uh, so um, I was trying to initially or are thinking that I may want to pursue a career in intelligence, um, and so I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultivating and those things and and and. Um, you know, uh, tailoring my studies towards it and, and trying to develop that as much as I can. Um, but eventually found that, that the lifestyle uh, that you would have to take on to do something like that uh, was not worth it to me, mm. at least not at that point in my life. And so I looked at the skill sets I had. I looked at my like uh, nearly six years of IT experience, you know, between being at Apple and being a system admin and, and all of these things. And uh, I decided to uh, try to, uh, to to basically go just full bore into the world of IT. Uh, I saw the opportunities there. I saw that there's basically a, a, a there's no ceiling until your earning potential, as long as you know, depending on what niches you go into and and uh, the the type of work that you're doing. And I decided to uh, go full bore into that industry and get into corporate IT instead of like small business and then like the, the Apple store type IT experience. And so as soon as I graduated um, uh, and got that piece of paper uh, and even towards the end of uh, graduation, uh, or sorry, uh, the end leading up to graduation, I started to try to cultivate new skill sets that would allow me to excel in the corporate IT space. And so a couple of things I was interested in, you know, I was interested in um, uh, cybersecurity as well as like systems engineering and, and systems administration. And so I started studying for industry certifications that would allow me to acquire jobs in these fields. Um, I also started learning uh, Russian uh, because of course, you know, uh, one of the <laughs> primary proponents or sorry, one of these proponents, one of the, uh, uh, one of the, I guess, um, one of, one of the principal, like, uh, I guess, aggressors, right? One of the, right, you know, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Right. One of, yeah. one of the principal aggressors in the cyber space, at least towards the United States is what it would be is Russia. Um, and so I decided to learn, uh, start learning Russian as well as studying for these, uh, IT certifications, as well as continuing to work more and more in the IT space. And so I was doing that while, you know, as well, like studying the ancient Greek for our comprehensive exams and, and all of these things so that when I got out of uh, grad school, I could kind of hit the ground running as opposed to waiting until the end and then going, well, what now? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I, yeah, graduated. Um, I luckily had this opportunity, moved in with my parents for a couple of months post-graduation in which I continued to do nothing but study for these certifications as well as work, continue to work as a system admin. Um, and from there, uh, I uh, got the certifications and looked for where the most opportunity in IT would be in, in some of these emerging markets. And one of them happened to be in Denver, Colorado. Um, and my uh, girlfriend uh, is from Denver and from Colorado. And um, we were both kind of looking for a change to move out of Florida. And so I decided to hop on, uh, jump on some opportunities uh, over there and uh, ended up working in with in getting a job in corporate IT for a software company out here. 
Wow. Wow. So, okay. So there, there's a lot in there that, that, you know, as, as they say in podcasting, there's a lot in there to unpack, right? <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so I guess my first question is, um, when you start to get the idea, okay, look, uh, I really like classics. I really like what I'm doing right now. You know, I've got a little bit of funding left. I have to finish this degree. I'm going to finish this degree. Um, you know, I, I've, I've gotten everything that I, that I think I'm going to get out of this. Um, when you start to, you know, mentally at least flip the switch and say, okay, I'm going to pursue this IT um, idea. Um, what exactly uh, is going through your head? Because are you sitting there saying, you know, it, are you saying to yourself first and foremost, I need to like get more IT education about this to figure out what's involved, you know, or are you saying at, at this point, are you already well-educated enough in the space where you're like, I know what's involved. Um, and, and it's, a, it's just a matter of sitting down and doing it. Um, and then when you do sit down and do it, how does that compare to what you've already been through with classics? Right. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I, you know, was working throughout my undergrad and through grad school in IT, I had a sense of what, uh, needed, I needed to have what sort of credentials I needed to have in order to work in the corporate space. Um, and so luckily I, I did do a little bit of additional research, especially since, you know, my time was sort of split. And so I, you know, I was a little bit separated from what it would take at, you know, the, the corporate level. And so after doing a little bit of research and kind of like calibrating uh, my focus and all of that, uh, I kind of what I just decided to sit and buckle down and just study for those certifications because I knew you know I had some I had the experience already to get one of these pr pr uh, positions but I didn't have a degree in in IT and um, was able to find out that you know these certifications would serve as a replacement more or less for a degree in, in the space so like you know you, you kind of have to have two you know three of the or two of the three you have to have the experience the certs or the uh, or the uh, the degree, and so I decided to you know go for the certs uh, since the idea of sitting through a four year degree in, in IT after just doing you know uh, grad school did not sound appealing to me, and and <laughs> and so I decided to to go after the self paced you know certification path more or less. And um, to be honest, like after because I already had some experience and uh, or a good amount of experience in the space. Uh, already like understood a lot of the concepts pretty well. Um, and just because it, it, it wasn't ancient Greek, you know, like it, it, the, the studying process was not incredibly difficult in comparison to, to, to doing classics. I would say classics was significantly more challenging, um, which made the transition a lot easier, right? Like the idea of sitting and studying eight hours a day, you know, for a certification, um, wasn't bad because I had just been sitting for eight hours a day studying ancient Greek, right? And 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 the the uh, like monetary benefits and the like lifestyle benefits that were at the end of this path that was getting these certifications was um, very. It was evident and it was like it was clear cut. Whereas like you know with uh, the classics program, you are gaining a lot of these skill sets, but like, you know, the, the direct benefits that you get from it don't, you, they don't really start appearing until after you start doing something else, right? Like until you say, what, it, like the, those benefits show up once you start studying for those certificates, at least for me, right? They, they sure. started showing up when I started studying for these certifications and going like, oh, I can sit here for eight hours and study for this and, and achieve something in three, you know, um, six weeks that might take someone who wasn't used to studying hours a day, three months, right? So it was, uh, that's, that's really kind of how that, how that came about and how that went. Wow. So, so now I have to ask, right. Is okay. You know, so let's, let's take me back to the time here. You're, you've gotten your certifications, right? It's, this is all self-taught. You're, you know, you're all, you know, you're sort of sitting down and you're doing this through a series of either books and, you know, online courses and, you know, whatever other materials you're using, you get these certifications, you do all this stuff. 
and now it's time to interview, right? And now it's time to, to actually get the job in the IT space. So take me into that interview because I, I would love to know what was said in that interview room when you show up with no, no, you know, IT degree, no computer science degree, no nothing degree, but a lot of archaeology and a lot of self-direction and a lot of motivation, you know, that must have been a fascinating interview to listen to. So, I mean, so how exactly did it go? So uh, I had interviewed at a couple places and luckily I had the experience on the resume. Um, and so that was sort of a, you know, a good arguing chip and, and kind of what attracted a lot of places to, to interview me. Um, uh, there was, I, at first on my resume, I had put the ancient Greek and Latin and had some pretty funny comments when asked about it. Like, uh, someone would ask me, and it says here, you know, you know, Russian, Greek, Latin, Italian, but do you know jive? And I was like, <laughs> what? He's like, you ever seen airplane? And I was like, oh, <laughs> and, uh, that's but <laughs> one of the great things, and, and this is something I, if, if anyone is interested, happens to be interested in both classics and the IT space, um, or IT topics, is that one of the great things about the IT field is most people end up in it from other fields. Um, I would say at my current position, you know, most of the people that I work with don't have degrees in anything computer related. Mm -hmm. They ended up there through pursue, you know, getting experience and pursuing those certifications. Um, and so uh, if, if you're interested in something like IT, it's, it's one of those things that you can, you can go into and not have to go to school for. And oftentimes it's not even, it's not worth going to school for because, you know, what you learn in the four-year degree by the time you graduate might be obsolete in the space, right? Because it's an ever-evolving, constantly moving forward uh, field in which you have to stay on top of the newest technologies, the newest, you know, software or coding language, all of that sort of thing. Um, and so a lot of the people in the space are looking for people, not necessarily that have a degree in um, IT, but that have skill sets and experiences that would make them good for the job, right? They're looking for people that they can hand an extremely challenging task to or something or a, hand a task that like might require a lot of studying and research and, and reading up on and troubleshooting and all of these things. And they want to know that you can handle it, right? And so when, like, when you're moving into, it's, it's at least in the, the realm of technology and IT or programming or any of that, um, uh, when, when you're interviewing for these jobs, a lot of the things they, they want to know is like, you know, can you problem solve? Can you look at like be handed an, an issue and start at a logical point A and get to logical point B and, and tell them how you got there, right? And, and that's something that like, you know, they would, they recognize uh, with things like classics degrees and humanities degrees and all of that is that your entire training is basically in critical thought. It's, it's in like looking at problems and, and trying to solve them and even like with minimal evidence or no evidence and, and using ab like, you know, like, um, either like straightforward thought processes or sort of abstract thought processes to and coming up with new ways to approach old problems and all these sorts of things and, and so a lot of the questions that you'll you'll get in these interviews especially i can only really speak for it and, and, and programming roles and stuff like that are problems that are, are interviewing and, and questions that examine the way that you think about things and not necessarily how much you know about x technology right because they can teach you that what they can't teach you is like how to solve the problem when it comes up so i, I would say a, a lot of the interviews you know there would be kind of a, a little bit of joking about you know it's like oh, it says here you have all this you have this it experience but you also were did archaeology and you like taught ancient greek history and it for like that's that's sort of weird but or like tell me about that like how did that like how did that come about and you know how did you handle both of those things and you know like what sort of experience did you get from it but then a lot of the actual you know in, uh, uh technical questions and all that are is much more geared towards like all right if i if i leave you alone and, and i give you a problem 
and then I leave and go on vacation, are you going to be able to handle it? And a lot of it is geared towards that. And that's something luckily that like these humanities degrees, classics degrees, these sort of things, like they really prepare you for in a way that I think like, you know, like other tracks might not. Or, or, or even problem solving your way out of a, uh, a jam that you might get into in Turkey. Um, because, you know, when you, <laughs> when you have a little baby problem, you know, in, uh, in Orlando, right, you know, you pick up your cell phone and, and it's not a problem anymore. But, you know, when it happens in rural Turkey, you know, you're, maybe you're not so, uh, so blessed, you know. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, one of the things that I always find, um, and I've heard this, you know, repeated to me over and over again, is that students who do have that kind of archaeology experience and classics background and everything else, when they do get a new um, a job interview type situation. Um, and it doesn't necessarily even have to be for a job. It could be for like further academic or different academic, um, appointments. You know, if you're, let's say you were a classics major as an undergraduate and, uh, you're now interviewing for law school or you're, you've done archeology span and, uh, now you're interviewing for, you know, medical school or whatever it is. Um, being able to tell one of those stories about a crazy thing that happened to you overseas, you know, has got to make you the most interesting person that they've talked to that day. Right. I mean, like, I, I can't imagine how many people, you know, if you're, if you're going to sit through, you know, a, uh, a, a round of interviews for, uh, for, you know, for medical school or even a round of interviews, you know, job applications for, you know, uh, an IT position, like what, like what you, what you have right now. Um, it's super competitive and you've got to be sitting there, you know, going up against hundreds of other applicants and other, you know, other people that are trying to, you know, do exactly what you're doing. And, you know, if, 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 if 50 of those hundred, you know, have the exact same resume and the exact same experience in it, you know, what, what's, what's keeping any of them, you know, from, uh, what, what is, what is holding the interviewer's attention you know, and if you are one of these people that have, you know, life experience and, and you you can talk about, you know, the, the wild stuff that happened to you, you know, in the past, um, you know, then you can, you can, you hold their attention and you are, you know, it does give you a little bit of a, an edge, I think. Um, I don't know, do, you know, or maybe I'm off my rocker here. I mean, or, or what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you think that's that's accurate or true or? I think that it, it but going into the more technical fields, right? Like going into IT, going into engineering or something, or a hybrid of, of, of those or programming or any of those, like th those types of um, career paths, having a background in something that's not purely uh, technical, right? Not purely engineering based or purely programming based or purely IT based or something like that gives you a significant leg up in the, the interview process in the way that you are able to like speak to someone and, and, and hold interesting conversations and all of that. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree in, in that sense because traditionally speaking, for things like engineering, it's a little bit more difficult to get into that that without you know an engineering degree, a lot of those jobs require it and reasonably so, right? They can't be like, well, you know, you know, ancient Greek, so you can probably figure out linear algebra, right? And you're <laughs> right. like, well, all right, maybe, yeah. So it doesn't necessarily work like that, but right. in the realm of things like IT, um, programming, that sort of thing, a lot of the people that took the very straightforward IT and programming path don't have the same, you know, like, I, I guess like ability to hold attention and, and, and speak to people and, and understanding of like social dynamics and all of these sort of things that you would develop as someone who's, you know, traveling all the time and, and like needing to like coordinate with locals and, and, and like do all these things that you, in these experiences that you would get doing something like archeology span or classics and all of that. So it definitely develops your people skills in a way that, 
you know, sitting and coding for 12 hours a day does not. And it's not that you can't. And of course, there's plenty of incredibly successful programmers and IT people and all of that that have IT degrees and program. It would be silly if there wasn't, right? But the, if, if when you're lit, when you're entering into a space when everybody has one of those degrees, if you're able to perform at that level, but also have all of this other experience that's, you know, not just the programming experience, then you become a much more attractive um, candidate for those type of things. And especially if you're going to move into thing, you know, uh, positions of management or, or like, you know, like uh, uh, um, guiding other people and that sort of leading other people and that sort of thing, it, it definitely benefits you in that regard, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it does. And it's, you know, this is, uh, this is what I keep on, you know, trying to hammer home. And, you know, this is, I think I think you've you've sort of hit on to why I decided to 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 start this project um, in the first place is because I, I I really do think that you know as you mentioned earlier you know your your sort of classics track you know was already like going extinct when you found it and has now since been you know I, I guess is now totally defunct you know and. Every time that that happens, you know, inside of a, in a university, inside of an undergraduate program, um, it's not like there's an, an infinite number of these these programs and these people who have the ability to to impart this kind of information and, and give people these skills. And, you know, there there will come a point where you if you close enough of these things, they will all be closed and it will be something that is lost, right? It will be something that we just, we don't, we don't, we don't do anymore in the United States. And, you know, my fear with that has always been that, you know, we train a generation or two or three of, you know, computer scientists, IT professionals, um, but maybe, you know, computer scientists, you know, working on AI research and I think I, I, I hit on this in episode one of the podcast as well. But, you know, when we start running into major problems um, that are technological problems, but these are problems that exist in, the, in sort of an intersection between technology and humanity, um, how people are interacting with technology. Um, and we start, you know, and these, and these problems start to compound, right? They start to get... They start to get worse, right? As as the as the technology moves quicker and quicker, or as bad actors decide to use that technology against us, um, you're gonna want people who who have this kind of broad classics training, um, because you know, and and I don't have to tell you this as as an ancient historian, but I mean, um, you know, I always looked at history as the gallery of bad ideas. You know, it's, it's for, for any mistake that you could possibly make in your life, somebody has made that mistake before and worse, right? And, and not only have they made that mistake, you know, 20 years or 50 years or hundred years, you know, before, but they've done it a thousand years, right? 2000 years before you. And, and, you know, one of the big advantages of, of doing classics is, is being able to learn from these people and their mistakes, um, and and being able to 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 take that on board and and use that to to try and you know sort of ameliorate you know your own thought process and your own decision making um, you know of course I say this as uh, as Facebook you know quietly conspires to uh, you know uh, totally destroy the country right and you know make us uh, <laughs> make us all flee right I mean it's like it's amazing it's amazing what a group of engineers and and software guys could do. Um, to undo all of the work of uh, of the founders of the country who who were all classicists, right? Um, you know, they there was a reason why they they looked to you know Republican Rome for like what the structure of our government was going to be, and they they sort of got to try on all the different constitutions, and they were like, you know, maybe this one will work, and it has, right? Up until Big Zuck got to it, so um, <laughs> you know. Now, now the real question is, is would we still be in the same predicament we're in right now if everybody at Facebook, you know, or maybe not everybody, but if, if like, you know, Facebook's executive committee, if they were all had a background in classics. Now, that's that's an interesting contrafactual. I don't know. 
Any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say that it's like any, there is a, and I'll even use the word profound, profound benefit to having a like knowledge and experience outside of the realms of technology while working in technology, right? And especially if you're working at the cutting edge, like places at Facebook and, and whatnot, where you're making decisions that will greatly impact humanity for either ever or at least years to come, right? Like it's 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 definitely important to have a perspective that's outside of purely the 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 code that's written in the terminal right like when just because you can doesn't mean you should and there as you said like with history being the gallery of bad ideas you can point to cases where it's like when we turn the robot on like maybe we should have double checked whether it could kill humanity first right <laughs> right and then and then and then understanding that that would have would have probably should should have been number one on the list right like not figuring out whether it can and and when you know before you like after you turn it on like it, it's like to to build these sort of ideas into the technology that we are creating right like building these sort of ethics and and and, and foundational concepts into every layer of the programming that we're doing and, and every layer of the technological systems that we're building and um and and like and you you don't really like get that when you when you pursue a purely technical um, um, education, right? Like you you your goals and your like <laughs> your lofty thoughts, I guess, are are about whether or not something works and not whether or not something should work, right? And and I think that's a an important distinction that you should have when you're especially at those cutting edge places. And so whatever you decide that that should be is, is kind of, you know, determinate, it, it differs between groups of people and, and all of that sorts of thing. And, um, but you definitely having that type of perspective and, and, and the pursuing these things in a, in a, in a way in which your first thought is, should I be doing this? And does it line up with this overall ethics that I'm trying to you know, create and or preserve as opposed to just like, I'm gonna you know, commit this line of code and just see, you know, see if it works, right? Like, and yeah. see if this project can come to life. So yeah, I, I definitely agree that um, like having that, that, that background in, in classics or background in, in studying history or background in studying humanities or travel, like, you know, doing some sort of multicultural work outside of the United States and, and, and studying the past in a way in which you could see these mistakes being made and, and being able to actually learn from them, right? Uh, or at least try to learn from them. Um, uh, is, is extremely beneficial, not only for the company you're working for, but, you know, for the world at large. And so, yeah. Yeah. yeah for the, for the world at large and, and, and selfishly for, for you, you know, selfishly for you, you know, for your own, your own, your own existence. I mean, you know, as, as I, you know, we were sort of talking about before and I keep on making a point of, of, of hitting this over and over again is the, the idea of, of, you know, not, not pursuing something that makes you feel hollow, um, and not, not having that, not having that, that sort of existential angst that, you know, is constantly, you know, sort of nipping at you, um, you know, because, you, you know, these are the, and, and the, again, I'm, I'm saying it from personal experience. I mean, I just, you know, I vividly remember being in like my, my second year of undergraduate and just going like, you know, is this, is this it? Is this what life is? Is this, is this my life? Is this, you know, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm like, am I going to really watch it end one day at a time here? I mean, am I going to, uh, you know, when do I get to do, you know, the cool stuff, you know, that I was, uh, that I was told about, you know, <laughs> when, I, when, when is that ever going to, you know, going to happen? And, um, I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people, you know, live like that. And it's, uh, it's a shame, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, and again, you know, it, not that classics is a, a panacea, and not that it's for everybody, because nothing's for everybody. But you know, it's a, it's another way out there, and uh, to get rid of it, I think, is really we are we are doing ourselves um, a major, major disservice. Um, right. Yeah. Well, Austin, I I don't know what to tell you here. We we've been we've been at it for two hours. <laughs> 
I, um, I really want to thank you again for taking the time to do this uh, with me just because, um, you know, when, when we sort of had the idea to, 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 to work on this project and relaunch this podcast and, you know, sort of change our format here a little bit, um, <clears throat> you were, uh, you, you, you wound up very high on, on my list for uh, people who I wanted to, uh, to be able to talk to. And I'm, I'm very glad that the first, uh, the first guest ever on the Matt Lupu podcast got to be, uh, Austin Voikavich. So, I mean, it really, really is a, a total pleasure for, uh, to talk to you for this long. And I, I really, I thank you so much for it because, um, you, you made some really, really great points. And I, I really, I hope it's going to be, you know, useful to somebody out there. They're going to listen to your story and be inspired. So hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> or at least not make the mistakes that I did. <laughs> they can read the gallery of bad ideas and be like, Oh, uh, oh note to self. Don't be like Austin, right? Stay away from these people. <laughs> I guess, yeah, the, the biggest thing I'd want to say is like, a, and, and I appreciate you bringing me on and all, of course, I can I, I'm come on as, as much as you, as much as you want and as, as much as helps the, the podcast grow if it does, you know, and um, I would say like the biggest thing and, and without trying to, uh, I don't come off as self-righteous or anything like that is, is, is just that you don't, if you, you can pursue these, you know, avenues of education and you're you're not pigeonholed right like you don't have to just become an academic and you don't just have to become a professor and that's the only way that these will benefit you and the, and these aren't useless pursuits right they they benefit you in ways that like aren't really quantifiable but like are extremely relevant and extremely important and, and especially for living like a a happy well-rounded life and that you shouldn't necessarily like only pursue education for a monetary like end because there's always a way to get there right like uh, the mon you 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 can always gain a skill set that will earn you money as long as you put in the time you put in the effort you will get there and you'll gain a skill set and so you shouldn't necessarily always pursue college or always pursue the university as like a means to a monetary end because it doesn't need to be and it can enrich you in like a lot of other ways and so it, it, don't think that just in don't think that just because you have a history degree you have to you know be a historian for the rest of your life you can do get a history degree and then go into it or or go you know go into construction if you want to right like you can you can be a lineman you can do anything you want to do if 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 money is is like your like goal or is one of your major goals and of course it is for a lot of people like don't only think about college as as the way to achieve it because there's way other ways to get uh, there's a many other ways to get there so yeah yes. and so yeah of course yeah thanks again matt for uh, no, 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 no 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 for bringing me on <laughs> thank thank you thank you i mean it's it's wide it's it's wise words right i mean and and, and i mean again you know thanks so much let's uh Let's, uh, let's, let's hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll pick up this conversation again, maybe in season two. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I would love to have you back again. Right. That's where I'll be homeless and broke. <laughs> <laughs> it, it all, it all fell down. It was all a lie. It was all <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> yeah. I lied. <laughs> all right. Well, take it easy, Austin. Right, yeah. On that note. Yeah. All right, see Thanks. Bye. Yeah.